Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the kickoff webinar in the Implementing Community-Based Violence Intervention Strategies webinar series. Throughout the webinar today, helpful links will be available in the chat box. Please submit your questions and comments in the Q&A box found at the base of your Zoom screen. The webinar will be recorded and will be available online afterwards. Captions are available and can be turned on or off using the menu at the base of your screen. Please also join the discussion today on social media using hashtag CVI Strengthening Communities. Now I am pleased to introduce you to our MC for today's webinar, Mr. Eddie Bocanegra, Senior Advisor in the Office of the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs. Thank you, Kiana. Well, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today, and we look forward to a rich discussion on the subject of community violence intervention. To start us off, I'd like to introduce Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon, who will share some opening remarks. Thank you, Eddie. I am so pleased to open this webinar series, and I am so moved by the commitment from so many people across the country to the health and safety of our communities. Today's session is the first of five webinars focused on expanding community violence intervention and prevention strategies. These strategies are grounded in research, and they're designed and led by experienced practitioners, and they offer tremendous promise in our efforts to reduce violence and build a stronger and safer America. For too long, we have leaned too heavily on policing as the only solution. And we've often downplayed the wealth of resources available through community-based service providers, faith-based organizations, and those with lived experience who are an invaluable source of wisdom. This imbalance has often fed into a cycle of trauma and victimization. We know there's a better way one that builds on what we've learned about violence and its causes. Research shows that community violence, gun violence in particular, can often be traced back to factors like fear, mistrust, and a lack of social and economic opportunity. It also shows that multifaceted, data-driven approaches can be effective in curbing violence. And you'll hear about some of these approaches during the webinar series. If we hope to achieve sustainable reductions in violence, we must embrace our community assets as a central ingredient in our violence reduction strategies. We have a huge opportunity in this moment. As all of you know, and in fact, thanks to the groundbreaking efforts of so many of you, President Biden has called for an unprecedented investment in community violence intervention strategies that will build up and help scale community infrastructure as a complement to law enforcement. In June, the president signed into law the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, which provides $250 million over five years, $50 million a year, to support community violence intervention and prevention programs. This builds on a $50 million appropriation for fiscal year 22, meaning that the Office of Justice Programs will soon announce investments of nearly $100 million in communities across the country. These resources will help develop and expand the community infrastructure needed to build community safety and strengthen our neighborhoods. These investments will support cross-agency collaborations that consider the challenges and the solutions, not simply from the perspective of adults or youth or from the standpoint of victims versus defendants, but holistically from the wider lens of the community. We'll see new efforts and fund expansion plans in both community-based organizations and in efforts led by mayor's offices and other local government agencies. Resources will also support intermediaries that will provide direct funding and technical assistance to help smaller organizations grow their work and build their capacity. And we'll make technical assistance available to any jurisdiction, regardless of whether or not they receive federal funding. Finally, and critically, we'll be investing in research and evaluation so that we as a field can learn as we go and develop stronger, deeper insights into what works to curb violence and save lives. 
we know that even more is needed given the demands on the ground. And President Biden's Safe for America plan, in fact, proposes $5 billion over 10 years to support CBI programs. To be clear, our number one goal at the Office of Justice Programs is to support communities so that they are strong and vibrant, where everyone has a chance to grow and thrive. We want to strengthen community partnerships, expand opportunities for our youth, address the trauma that many people involved in violence have faced, and use data and science to guide us to effective and sustainable public safety solutions. When I joined the President and Justice Department leaders at the White House in July to celebrate the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, I saw what I'm seeing today. Hundreds of concerned and committed people from all walks of life and every corner of our country, many of them survivors, many driven by their own profound experience of pain and loss. I was awed and inspired by their resilience and by their tenacious hope in the wake of tragedy. After hearing their stories and so many of your stories, I could only nod in agreement at how our president captured the work we're all doing. He said, what we're doing here today is real, it's vivid, it's relevant. The action we take today, he continued, is a step designed to make our nation the kind of nation we should be. What you're doing is real and relevant to your communities, and it is vital to fulfilling the promise of a better, a safer, and a more just nation. I am so grateful for your contributions, and I look forward to the progress that we will make together. Thank you, Amy, for those remarkable comments. Uh, I'd like to take the next uh, second to do, also introduce Director Carlton Moore, uh, who is leading our efforts at the Bureau of Justice Assistance. Director Moore. Welcome to this inaugural webinar in OJP's new series, Implementing Community-Based Violence Intervention Strategies. The goal of this webinar series is to provide information, resources, and tools that communities can use as they plan and implement CBI programs. One such tool is the BJA CBI checklist released last mm -hmm. spring, which provides a detailed set of issues communities should consider as they move forward on these efforts. As you know, CBI strategies require community level collaboration of stakeholders in multiple sectors, as well as the buy-in and input from community residents. This tool provides a roadmap for that process and serves as the framework for this webinar series. As Amy Solomon mentioned, BJA and our OJP partners are making significant investments in both site-based projects and training and technical assistance for the field. It is our hope that we can work with communities in learning more about best practices in CBI strategies and assist local jurisdictions in identifying ways to sustain these efforts when federal funding is no longer available. I look forward now to hearing from this distinguished group of experts with extensive experience working with community-based organizations to make their community safer. Thank you. Thank you, Director Moore, and thank you once again, Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General Amy Solomon, for your unwavering leadership and commitment to this issue. As I look at those who are in attendance today, I'm excited for the opportunity of coming together as a learning community where we elevate examples of best practices, partnerships, ideas, and research. The overall goal for this webinar series are centered around commitment to collaboration, building the ecosystem, and advancing best practices. Today's conversation and those to come are just one piece of OJP's commitment to supporting our partners who are doing the critical work on the ground and who are ensuring that the people who are most in need of these resources have access to them. I feel very privileged to be in this position at the Department of Justice, extremely grateful for the opportunity to leverage my life experience to help inform our colleagues and our collective efforts uh, as we tackle the issue of CVI 
in this initiative. Having said that, while there are many lessons that I have learned along the way in my career, here are three that I encourage you to consider as you move forward and which I'm sure that many of you already are incorporating into your work. The first, the importance of multidisciplinary collaboration. We're not gonna simply program our way out of this community violence issue. No one program, discipline, or profession can single-handedly solve this issue, and no one of them can dominate the discourse of this issue as well. Only through partnerships can we build a multifaceted approach that allows communities and individuals to reach their full potential. In fact, today, we are joined by some amazing community leaders who will share more on what that looks like in practice, the challenges, the lessons learned, and the rewards. Secondly, focusing on high-risk individuals is critical if we aim to reduce gun violence. From recent studies and from our own experience, we know that gun violence is concentrated in predominantly disinvested communities, particularly communities of color. In some cities, shootings in these communities account for 70 to 80% of total homicides. So it's not enough to simply say that one works in an at-risk community. We need to focus on the individuals in those communities who are at the highest risk of shooting or being shot. But how do we define or distinguish those who are more likely to be a victim or perpetrator of gun violence? The individuals that I'm referring to rarely seek social services and are more difficult to engage in programming. And when they do engage, too often their needs exceeds our resources available. And third, the centrality of trauma responsive interventions. With every shooting, with every homicide, there's a ripple effect that have a lifetime impact on the victim, those who perpetrate the violence, and those who either witness firsthand or are left to pick up the broken pieces. This is something far too familiar for many of you on this call. Research and science have contributed to our understanding and the benefits of responding to issues around trauma. When you look at early childhood development and US military veterans who have served in combat, we have learned a great deal about how to best care for these populations. It's time to apply that same focus to healing the trauma of gun violence. We need to look at non-traditional approaches outside of clinical settings that include peer-based supports, staff care models, and innovative kind of behavioral interventions that reflect the needs of this population. In 2017, following a year in which Chicago experienced over 750 homicides and nearly 4,000 shootings, the philanthropic community and nonprofit leaders came together to tackle the issue of gun violence in a way that was unprecedented. This gave birth to a few initiatives, including the Red Chicago model, which I had the pleasure of leading. One of the first things that I did in my role was look at the quality of life plans that the Chicago List created in partnership with local leaders, some in which we'll hear today. This, in many ways, is what informed our grassroots approach to working in the communities we worked in. For the next hour and a half, we'll be hearing from experts in the field that have created authentic engagements in, to ensure community voices are at the table when decisions are being made that will create a lasting impact in our communities. We'll also hear about the importance of building, creating partnerships so that violence interruption work isn't the sole responsibility of one agency or one organization. I wanna pause here, as this is a critical point. We at OJP see this work as not the sole responsibility of CVI agencies but as a responsibility of community as a whole, working together. We're excited to collaborate with local initiatives to support cooperation today to share some of the lessons from their collaborations with CVI agencies, researchers, and local leaders implementing this work throughout the country. I am pleased to be joined by LeVar Michael, Senior Program Officer with the LISC National Safety and Justice Team who worked very closely with our DOJ BGA team to create the CVI PI checklist tool. But prior to passing it to him, I wanna share a quick video highlighting the work of one of the, their partners and their efforts that had a positive impact in shaping my work in the community, particularly in North Londo, 
as well as a number of other challenges that actually face this community, which you'll hear more about. I'd like to ask uh, your support at this moment to also please pull your phone out. And we need to make some noise here today. And we ask you that as you are pulling your phone out uh, and not necessarily being distracted from what you're hearing today from our panelists, that you help promote and encourage through your social networks by leveraging hashtag CVI strengthening communities. With that, before I pass it to Levon, we'll share our, the video. What we've learned is that we're not just doing workforce development. We really are helping a person regain their sense of self-worth. My name is Brenda Palms Barber, and I am the founder and CEO of Sweet Beginnings. Sweet Beginnings was a response to creating jobs for men and women who had criminal records and who weren't exactly ready to be competitive for jobs. In engaging with local employers, we found that very, very few were actually receptive to hiring someone with a criminal background. And so the business is local honey that we produce here in Chicago and honey infused skincare products that we distribute. It's a three month program. We try to teach basic fundamental business skills. Uh, we emphasize teamwork and communication. The first month you're here, it's learning the basic skills of production. The second month, you actually get a chance to meet others and teach others what you've learned. And the third month that you're here, we actually start working with you to get you prepared for that next job. I never worked a job before in my life, so this was my first opportunity to pitch someone on a resume. I learned so much. Uh, I love working with the bees and my babies. For my family or the people in North Carolina, they to tell me, Charlotte, I'm proud of you. They always bring tears to my eyes. After serving 17 years, Squeak Again has helped me with a fresh start, and it also enabled me to provide for my family. It's lovely to know that 15 years later, we're about to serve our 500th employee. My hope for Sweet Beginnings is that we'll double the number of people that we hire in a year. We want to be able to be there to help folks reintegrate back into society and restore their sense of self-worth. Sweet Beginnings really is creating Sweet Beginnings for folks in the best of ways. All right, thank you so much. Uh, and Eddie, thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is LeVar Michael, Senior Program Officer with the Local Initiative Support Corporation Safety and Justice Team. And just wanna take a second to thank everyone to, uh, for joining today's webinar. Um, we really hope to have a very productive conversation today. Uh, so today we have lined up for you two panels. Uh, first uh, panel that you'll hear from today will focus their attention on engaging community partners, residents and stakeholders in an effort to enhance CVI planning and implementation. Uh, the second panel you'll uh, hear from today will focus their attention on developing strategic and thoughtful partnerships to complement and reinforce CVI planning and implementation. Um, so as stated earlier, you know, I think we know first and foremost that the number one goal of CVI programming should always be to save lives. That's the number one goal, and I think we can all agree on that. Uh, and this should be done using evidence-informed strategies and community-centered initiatives to engage individuals who are involved in or connected to community violence with the goal of disrupting those cycles of violence. However, we also know that the second goal must be to provide those same individuals the resources, the tools, the support, the opportunity they need to live healthy and productive lives. And, you know, I think that's where we as a nation have fallen short. We shouldn't be focusing just on saving lives alone, but we should be focusing on creating avenues of opportunity for people to live, to thrive, and have successful and productive lives. So the question then becomes, how can CVI practitioners, who we know work tirelessly each and every day to save lives, how can these folks also galvanize support to create communities of opportunity for the individuals they serve. And that's where engagement and partnership development 
as highlighted in the CVIPI checklist, which we'll talk more about in a second, becomes a critical component to CVI programming. You know, I think it's time for us to acknowledge that CVI programs cannot and should not do this work alone, but should be supported and reinforced by strong community collaboratives and partners focused on saving lives, but also focused on creating opportunity. Uh, it's also time for us to acknowledge that we as a nation will continue to chase ourselves in circles when it comes to addressing issues of community violence. If and until we have the courage, the will, and determination to finally address systemic issues of structural racism, uh, economic disinvestment, and a lack of opportunity, which we know historically plays a role in driving community violence. So how do we get to the point of addressing these systemic issues through CVI work? Well, that's where uh, taking a comprehensive approach to CVI work comes into play. Having an understanding of the comprehensive nature of this work was really central in BJA's development of the CVI PI checklist. BJA, LISC, and partners at CNA uh, worked with many of you throughout the country, uh, spoke with you, uh, CVI practitioners, researchers, TTA providers. We held listening sessions to obtain direction from you and feedback on the development of this tool, which really works to define CVI, uh, provide a roadmap of essential elements of CVI, and also promotes a set of guiding principles uh, that can aid communities in understanding the comprehensive nature of this work. This checklist provides a step-by-step -step process for guiding CVI efforts locally and also assisting organizations which may be new to CVI work with a clear understanding of terminology and definitions associated with the CVI uh, PI programming. Next slide, please. And the checklist guiding principle really works to ground practitioners to those core components that lead to the successful implementation of CVI efforts. Being community centered by engaging the community authentically and prioritizing the needs of the community that you work with. Um, being equitable and inclusive, understanding that those impacted most by community violence must be included in creating solutions to the problems in their own community. And also being evidence informed, you know, being data driven, utilizing findings from research, evaluations, case studies, documented lessons learned to help inform your work. And lastly, being effective and sustainable, demonstrating measurable impacts uh, on violence and community well-being. All these things together will go a long way in assisting CVI practitioners and organizations in truly understanding the comprehensive nature of CVI work. Next slide, please. And this comprehensive vision uh, where we build the community voice, where we engage local service providers, uh, where we partner with local government. This connects back to that quality of life planning process that Eddie referenced during his opening remarks. Community planning processes like these serve as a great resource and tool for CVI practitioners who are looking to, uh, to develop local partnerships and to advance and complement their CVI work. And this type of approach is foundational to the work we do here at LISC and the work that we do with over our over 2,200 um, community partners we work with throughout the country. Our core work as an organization is to uplift disadvantaged communities by working with community residents and partners on the ground to create vibrant and sustainable communities of opportunity for the residents we serve. Our work is centered on investing in communities that need it the most, working to build the capacity of community-based organizations uh, and local partners, and most importantly, supporting people and places through investments in housing and business development, job creation, schools, public health, community safety, and so much more. Next slide, please. So this quality of life planning process is something that LISC has supported for years in many communities throughout the country. Uh, quality of life planning is a community-driven planning process, which convene, convenes residents, service providers, stakeholders, local organizations to work together in developing a vision for a neighborhood and then developing strategies which can bring that vision to life. 
And throughout this process, partners will discuss issues such as workforce development issues, local housing issues, community violence issues, poverty, and a host of other topics uh, with the hope of identifying solutions to those problems. And it's important to note, LISC isn't the only organization which engages in this type of community planning. There are community-based organizations throughout the country which are working to solve community problems each and every day. And we really encourage CBI partners and practitioners uh, to partner and link up with those types of organizations. Next slide, please. So some may ask, you know, why take this comprehensive approach to disrupting cycles of community violence? And I think the answer is clear. No matter what city you look at, and here we're looking at the city of Chicago, one thing remains true. The same communities which experience high rates of community violence, next slide, mm -hmm. are the same communities which see high levels of poverty, That's next right. slide are the same communities that have high levels of unemployment. That's right. Next slide. And are the same communities that have high mortality rates. So when you look at these heat maps and you see that the same communities which experience high levels of community violence are also the same communities that contend with these historic systemic issues. When you see that these statistics call out to us to focus on saving lives, but to also focus our attention on creating better community conditions by enhancing opportunities for the individuals we serve. And that cannot be done without strong community engagement and recruiting partners who can reinforce your CVI work. And that's exactly what we wanna to talk to you about today. Uh, so now on to the best part of today, and this is our introduction of our first panel. Um, so I'd like to introduce to you Brenda Palms, who is the president and CEO of the North Lawndale Employment Network in Chicago. Brenda, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're also joined today by Anthony Smith, Executive Director of Cities United, a national network focused on eliminating violence nationwide. Anthony, thank you as well for joining us today. Uh, so Brenda, I think we're gonna send our first question to you. So first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your background, uh, but most importantly, uh, let us know, why was it important for an employment service organization like North, uh, North Lawndale to be involved in community safety efforts and how North Lawndale, through that quality of life planning, aided the community in thinking differently about the services being provided to those most at risk of being involved in community violence? Well, good afternoon, LaVar, and thank you. Um, I can only underscore so many of the points that you've made already. Um, uh, but I, first of all, I'll start by saying that I have had the pleasure and honor of serving the North Lawndale community as the president and CEO of the North Lawndale Employment Network for about 22 years now. And I would also say that I am so pleased that LISC uh, Chicago has been a core partner of the North Lawndale Employment Network. I was just thinking for at least 18 years, 18 of those 22 years. So we have a long um, and steadfast partnership with LISC. And, and more recently, as um, we've been proud to be uh, a founding and pioneering partner with um, Chicago Ready. Um, and, and I just wanna share a little bit about our, our background because it's important to know that North Lawndale is like so many of the other communities across the country that are battling some of the challenges that you've already lifted up, primarily driven by poverty and, 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 and intentional uh, disinvestment and systemic and institutional racism. But I will tell you that we're a community of 35,000 residents 88% of our community are African-Americans. 45% of our community are under 24 years of age. So we're a younger neighborhood. Um, our unemployment rate vacillates three times, almost four times that of the, of, the, um, of the country and certainly that of the city of Chicago, anywhere between 15 and 20%. And three times Chicago's violent crime rate um, happens in this neighborhood. And another really um, unfortunate statistic is that 12% of the, 
of the Illinois prisoners um, that are in the state of Illinois come from North Lawndale zip codes. So we were established in 1999 to essentially address the high unemployment rate in this community. And it was interesting because I kept thinking, well, why is the unemployment rate in this neighborhood so much higher than others? And after lots of conversations and one-on-ones meeting with community, uh, a theme did begin to emerge. And that theme essentially was that I have a brother or I have a a congregation member um, who's returning, who's coming back. And it really uh, made me wonder, well, what is the impact of incarceration in our community? Come to find out that in addition to the statistics I just shared, nearly 60% of the adults in our community have had some involvement in the criminal justice system. And so what I want to pause and say is that people tend to demonize communities that are deeply struggling with poverty and sometimes say, oh, well, those are bad neighborhoods. It's, it's that they're struggling to have a quality of life and sometimes you make poor choices when you have limited options. And so there are good people that live in our communities, but because of this intentionality that you discussed earlier, people are definitely struggling. So why is it important for uh, employment services you know, to be a part of community um, intervention strategies? I think Certainly we know that research tells us that there is a direct relationship between um, working and those who don't have traditional jobs. And I do want to underscore, right, LeVar, that people may be working, but they're not necessarily working in traditional employment. Um, And so what we know is that there's less crime in communities when people are working, but money matters. People need money to work. Um, People need money to survive. And so the value of a job is that it plays a role in people understanding, especially a good job, about their value. It gives people an opportunity to make honest money. It helps to reduce the financial stress that our families experience. People learn new things and new opportunities around themselves, around the world, and really regain their their sense of self-worth. So having a quality job helps you feel like you're a part of something and that you matter. And and, and unfortunately, as as Eddie mentioned, so many of the people that we serve are disconnected from some of the traditional resources. They don't have access to to that. So that's why we were excited. We felt it was important for us as a workforce development organization to be in partnership around um, community violence and and being a part of those strategies there. There was a saying um, that really used to uh, get under my skin, right? Which was, you know, people would say, oh, the best way to stop a bullet is through a job, right? And I'm like, it's just not that simple. And we cannot put the weight of, you know, violence reduction solely on the shoulders of jobs. They are critical. But what I love about this conversation is that we're finally acknowledging that this is about all of us. We all play a role. And that's the role that our quality of life planning played. You know, for us to sit around as a community, this plan was informed by the residents and stakeholders of North Lawndale. And we set priorities. What's important to us? What is our vision for what a healthy community looks like? Um, And so with that, we, um, oh my goodness. And so with that, we knew that we had to um, work together to not just treat violence in our neighborhood as a single thing, but that every single aspect of our quality of life plan impacts the quality of life and reducing of sort, certainly crime and violence in our neighborhood. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that. And it's so important to hear your perspective on how the quality of life planning aided in building that community voice, right? Having those community partners at the table. And, and Anthony, uh, this next question is for you, uh, just to build on that. Um, so first, you know, uh, also tell us a little bit about yourself, your background. Uh, but also how uh, Cities United, your work at Cities United and the work that your team does ensures that community voice is infused into local CBI uh, CBI collaborations and efforts. Um, We know just how important that is to to have that community voice and, and would love to hear from you how you guys go about advocating for that. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Lamar. Thank you too, Brenda, uh, for your uh, for your answer and response. And again, thank you all for the invite uh, to be a part of this conversation. It's timely. It's needed. Uh, and the, we're at a sense of urgency of how we build these out and how we not only build it out, how do we continue to support the work in the long term, right? So uh, uh, again, Anthony Smith, I'm the executive director for Cities United. Uh, I've been leading Cities United for the last seven years. Uh, uh, before that, and I'll talk a little bit more about what Cities United is, but I'm giving a little more background. Before that, I uh, worked uh, in Louisville uh, with Mayor Fisher and others to help open up their office of safe and healthy neighborhoods. Uh, which focused on re hom homicides and uh, shooting reductions and helped build out our One, one Love Louisville plan. And before that, just to tie some connections to Brenda, I did a lot of work around uh, organizing around education and, and workforce and, 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 and economics. So it all comes together as you think about the work. And as you think about Cities United, uh, we were founded in 2011 uh, under the leadership of Mayor Nutter, uh, out of Philadelphia when he was the mayor there. Uh, Dr. Bell, who runs Casey Family Programs, uh, Mayor Landrew from New Orleans, uh, and then the Chan Dove from the Campaign for Black Male Achievement. Uh, really because Mayor Nutter and Mayor Landrew were concerned about the number of uh, loss of life that they were experiencing every day and did not have a space where they can go and share best practices with their other peers. So they created this space really to help mayors understand that what the, the issues are, what the what, what's working and what's not working and what they could bring back to their cities. Uh, but as we started this work, just to your point, LeVar, it was always important and critical that the, the voices of community help guide the work, right? Not just uh, the, the, the intervention piece, but the holistic work that we're all talking about is really thinking about how and where and making sure that not only that community members at the table, but they're helping to lead the work and they're helping to come up with the solutions. Uh, so for Cities United, when we come in, we're partnering with cities. Our job really is just to work with the mayors and their teams to help them better partner with their community members to really develop what we call a comprehensive public safety strategy, right? Really helping folks understand that CVI work and the work that Brenda just laid out is really public safety work. This is how we keep communities safe. This is how we keep individuals safe. And this is how we keep families safe is that families have access to the opportunity that you talked about, LeVar, but that we have CVI workers who are trained and skilled to really intervene uh, when violence is bubbling up. And, and, and But then once they can squash that, where do I send folks who are ready to move on to a different lifestyle? So we've got to make sure that these wraparound services are close by and they're not uh, afterthought, but they're a part of our strategy as we build it together. Uh, so Cities United really comes in and help walk cities and mayors through what we call our roadmap to safe, healthy, and hopeful community. Uh, and it starts really thinking about the planning process, who's at the table, who needs to be at the table, who's missing, uh, so that we can bring all of those folks together. And then we start thinking about what do we do? What are, what are the immediate things that we need to do to reduce violence, right? What's CVI models? What's the, what are we bringing in, right? What does, the, what does the ecosystem of CVI look like in your city? But then also start thinking the up, upstream work that Brenda talked about and others around what are we doing to make sure that young people who are gonna be most at risk are not pushed out of school? Right. What are we doing to make sure that they have access to employment? What are we doing to make sure that their families are living in affordable and safe housing, right? And stable housing. What are we doing to make sure that families have access to livable wage jobs where they can take care of themselves and their families, right? So when we start thinking about the holistic of this work, we know that as long term, there's some things that we can do today that will interrupt the cycle of violence within the next one to three years. But there's also things that we got to put in place that just disrupts the whole pipeline, right? Not just what's happening today, but how do we disrupt the pipeline? But community members need to be with you all along the way. So we're real clear when we come into a city that this is not a city developed plan. This is a community and city developed plan together uh, that the city kind of helps lead. But community voice has got to be key. Uh, and I'm not just talking about those who are directly impacted. This is also indirect impacted folks. And then also those folks who don't even see themselves at the table. You've got to engage all of community so that we can really do an all hands on deck approach to really addressing this work. But I think when we think about CVI and the immediacy that we need, uh, part of this is uh, part of the, also the conversation is some of this is educating community on what CVI is. Mm -hmm. uh, community members still don't understand what the work is, what the dangers of the work is, what the importance of the work is. 
uh, and what folks are and what the people who are on the front line are really doing. Right. These are our heroes every day who are saving lives. And a lot of people just don't know who they are and what they do. So how do we help elevate the work and how do we help elevate those who lead the work? So for us, it really is clear. We just got you've got to have them at the table. They've got to be helping making decisions and they've got to help lead the solutions as we move the work forward. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that's such a good point. And and I think that's where that community planning process can really aid. Right. Is helping people, helping to ground people, helping uh, to uh, divvy up work helping to decide the path forward uh, from a community standpoint, right? Um, and so just going back to that uh, that discussion around uh, community planning, uh, we also know there are a number of roadblocks, right? That have the ability to stymie local CVI planning efforts, right? If people are coming together to plan for a CVI program locally, um, there could be issues of lack of trust. There could be planning fatigue, right? We hear that from communities all the time. I'm sick of sitting here talking about planning, you know, when are we gonna start getting stuff done and doing stuff, right? So people are a little reluctant to engage in planning sometime. Um, so what are some creative approaches that you have noticed to be impactful in avoiding some of these types of roadblocks, Brenda? Uh, such a good question. Um, and so I'm going to keep it very real and just first of all say that, you know, collaborations are really, really hard. Um, and I don't think they're that natural. I think that we tend to feel like we can by ourselves change the world. Um, and then eventually we get knocked upside the head and we realize that we are stronger and better together. And um, that was one of the reasons I think that we were successful uh, in our North Lawndale Community Coordinating um, Council model, um, because we have been forming, storming and norming over and over again for the greater good. And so what's happened is, you know, I, I will say that, you know, this kind of work it's sticky and it's no pun intended, honey, honey, pun intended, right? Um, but it's it's certainly sticky and messy and it's hard, but this is not work for the faint of heart. I will tell you that the people that we have around the table um, in North Lawndale are people who've been deeply committed this, to this work for an average of 15 years. And, and what's happened is we've learned to respect one another and that takes time. I'm just, Honestly, you know, we tend to think, well, you know, what are they doing or they're not right or they're perfect. It's easy to start pointing fingers. But what's happened is when you come together and you have authentic and honest and raw conversations about your hopes and vision and dreams for the neighborhood, then your ego starts to become less important. And this greater vision about what we want to accomplish for our neighborhood um, rises up to the top of our priority. And so we can find space to be vulnerable with one another, which is important for establishing trust. And that we also have been at it for a long time. Um, and I remember when we first jumped into this work, I remember thinking, well, what are those outreach people really doing? Mm. You know, um, I'm, I'm a workforce development professional, right? And um, it took me a minute to really observe the depth and the quality of relationship that our outreach um, workers establish with those who, as Eddie said earlier, are disconnected from traditional systems and resources. And I thought, that's not something we do well, right? Let me honor what they bring to the table so that they can then respect what, what we're going to offer and help give these folks the tools, the belief, the, the, the certifications that they need in order to be competitive in traditional work. So I think it's something honestly um, that I'm sure Anthony would agree that it just takes time. And I think that's the other lesson here is that it's, you know, it's taken time for folks to be in a situation where they're at, you know, generations in many cases. So for us to think that we can quickly, you know, turn someone around and help get them on this path is, is not, it's not accurate, um, but I do think that the way to have population level impact and to really see a difference in community is through coming together and dealing with the messiness of collaboration, knowing that you have a vision that's going to really affect the quality of life um, for everyone in the long run. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. And that's the power of partnership, right? Because you may have some skills that I don't have, right? Or the person to, you know, uh, my side may have skills that I don't have and can complement the work that I'm doing. And I think that's really what we're trying to communicate to people today is that, you know, we can't think of CVI just as this very isolated, singular uh, thing, right? We need to broaden our, our understanding of what this work could really be when we enhance engagement and enhance partnership. So I, I definitely appreciate that point. Um, Anthony, over to you again. Um, one of the things that's critically important, you know, we talk so much about building the capacity of organizations, which, which is critically important. But, you know, what about building the capacity of local residents to become leaders, right? And to take on a lot of these responsibilities of reducing violence in their neighborhoods. Um, what are some tips you can provide CBI programs related to ways they can increase the capacity of local residents and equip them with the knowledge and skills they need to be effective partners and to work hand in hand with a lot of these uh, violence interrupters and outreach workers uh, that are out there each day doing great work? Yeah, uh, thank you for that. I, I do want to add another barrier that I think we do got to make sure that we raise. Uh, yeah. it, it really is the access to resources, right? I think we want to make sure that we're clear. More dollars are coming down the pike from the federal level. States are looking at it. Cities are using their opera dollars and other funding. But what we also are saying is that we are building out the capacity of the CVI field. Uh, that has been truly underfunded for decades, right? Folks have been doing this work on shoestrings budget. So I wanna make sure that while we're thinking about comprehensively, there's still a lot of support and, and build out that the CVI, uh, the community violence ecosystem still needs. Uh, and we wanna make sure that we don't move away from building that out as we start thinking about the wraparound services. Uh, so this access to resources, I think is also a barrier on part on partnership, but then also on capacity building for organizations to have the biggest reach that they could. Uh, but when you think about, you know, uh, how CBI organizations, you know, at the root of community violence intervention is community and is residents. And I don't know any other folks in the field who don't have strong relationships with communities, especially the communities that they work in every day, uh, uh, where they probably get most of their intel from, right? So I think community members are already engage in a way because these are trusted messengers who they're talking to who they would rather have a conversation with them about what's going on uh with their with somebody in their family or somebody that's you know in trouble uh because i live in louisville kentucky and i work with an organization all the time called no more red dots and when i talk to dr woods who runs the program i can call him if i have a grandmother who calls me and says i think my grandson's in trouble i need to i need to talk to somebody who can help kind of squash this and help, you know, my, you know, my grandson stay safe. That's who I would call, right? So I think if, at the end of the day, some of this is really around not how can they be better connected and better partners, it's really highlighting the partnerships that are already there uh, and allowing folks again, back to my earlier point, to understand who are these credible messengers who are doing life-saving work every day that you need to know. And if they come to your porch and if you see them in the community, you can share with them what's going on and they'll they've got the skill sets to really help uh intervene they got the skill sets to help connect somebody to Ms. brenda's organization they got the skill sets to really help whoever you know is in trouble in your life uh who are in harm's way to really move to a different place right so i think the ideal for me is really we just got to build on what we have mm -hmm. and, and kind of really think about the strength that's already there and, and elevate it more and talk about it more. But then I do, but part of it to your question though, LeVar, is how do we, I don't want to say system, uh, make it more like uh, systematic because I think what we know right now are this organic growth of these organizations and, and of the work has been really, really powerful and innovative, but there is some opportunity to connect some dots uh, and for community members, when they think about public safety, to think about CVI workers, to think about CVI organizations, so part of it is around how we message the work and, mm -hmm. and how we make sure that the CVI organizations have enough resources to actually spend time on Ms. Brenda's parts and talk about what the work, spend time at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the house of faith to talk about what the work is and to really explain how they can be helpful and be more utilized in the work. So I think, again, it just goes back to the capacity that we need to continue to help build uh, because I believe when you think about this work and there's been surveys and things put out, 
that when folks start, when you ask folks if they support this work and if they would vote for more funding for it, they will, but just are not given the opportunity a lot of times to even have a conversation with the folks who make those kind of decisions. Mm. But folks believe in this work and believe in the people who do this work. I just don't think they know how broad and how many people in their community actually do this work. Uh, and then also who wants to get in it. Uh, uh, last thing I will say is I think, you know, it'll be later in a question too, is that part of uh, this, this conversation that we're having around CVI uh, is not a, 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 the, the terminology is kind of new to folks, uh, uh, but the work is not new, right? So we got to connect those dots for folks to make sure that they understand Community violence intervention uh, might be a new terminology or a new way to talk about the work, but you've seen Dr. Woods in his community for 30 years. You've seen Pastor Jones in Pittsburgh in his community for the last 20 years. These folks have been doing this work, but they're under this umbrella now. So let's let's help connect some of the dots. So I think that's where I would go with Lamar with that. Lavar with that is that it's really about just strengthening the relationships that are already there but also elevating the, the, the folks who do the work and the organizations who do the work so people know who they are and what they do. Yeah, yeah, I like that. And, you know, I have a colleague that often says, you know, the same thing. This is work that's been done for years. You know, we just call it something different today. Um, but I love that idea of like really connecting these dots for folks so that they can really understand that that aspect. Um, and Brenda, this is sort of shifting gears a little bit. Uh, but I want to make sure that we hit on this issue of uh, analyzing, collecting uh, localized data to better understand, you know, what's driving community violence. Um, I know that, you know, the process of looking at community-wide data sets, examining local data is a piece of that, you know, community planning process uh, that, that folks engaged in, you folks in Chicago engaged in. Uh, and, and that's part of what Eddie mentioned was like very uh, instrumental for him and, and helped him get a sense of what was going on in the area uh, when he was working uh, there in Chicago. So can you speak a little about the importance of CBI programs being data driven and using, you know, violence assessments or other tools to help inform decision making? and also how they should think about engaging partners in this area, uh, particularly uh, when it comes to focusing on high-risk individuals, right? We know uh, it's important to have researchers, universities, you know, et cetera, at the table to help in that area, so. Well, certainly um, data changes everything. You know, it's, we can work so hard uh, and make, and know that we're making a difference but it isn't until you can measure that impact, um, measure the depth of what you're working on, that you can then spark change and elevate the issue. Um, there was a long time when I, we were doing the work here, uh, serving people, and I would say, I think we have a lot of people that have criminal records in North Lawndale, right? And people are like, oh, okay, you know. But when I could say 57% of the adults in North Lawndale have had some involvement in the criminal justice system. Suddenly that is a game changer. And that's really what's happening with CVI as well. So two couple of things, right? First of all, let's just talk about data. Um, it is not sexy, it is not fun. People, right. people, you know, who have a passion for work often aren't the people that have a passion for inputting data. And so when Anthony talked about, you know, resources and capacity, I'm like, yeah, that was where we had to spend a lot of money and time just getting our staff to understand the importance of collecting uh, and capturing data. Um, but there is a sensitivity to this that I think that is so important about who is the convener, who are the practitioners on the ground. They have to be trusted and respected. North Lawndale is a community that has, I can't even tell you, thousands of research studies that have been done in this community. I'm sure that's common for lots of neighborhoods. And there is a, um, a hesitation um, to partner with researchers because it's like, how will this impact us? You know, um, someone else is gonna go off and get a, get a report, get a, be on television, talk about this report, but it doesn't come back to benefit the neighborhood. So I just wanna say that I'm really, really pleased that in our data collection efforts um, in working with the University of Chicago Crime Lab that we have been able to ensure that we're treating data with respect. 
and that we're honoring the people whom we're engaging in this work um, as thought leaders and thought partners in this work, not subjects. Um, and, I, and I think that that's what's important. So absolutely, um, data allows us to tell a story um, and to help quantify the, and know that we are making a real impactful difference. I love knowing, for example, that the uh, violence reduction of folks in our neighborhood has, um, that 75, 79% of the people that we serve who have committed those crimes have not committed crimes. 79% for those who stay engaged in our programming. That's huge. Um, but without being able to tell that story with data, it's, it doesn't have the same impact. So I can, I, I can go on, but I just want to say that that's the key. The problem for us was, of course, how do we empower people on the ground to collect that data and help to collect those stories? Um, yeah. so time has to be spent building capacity there. Absolutely. Now I become a data nerd, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's helpful for all of us to become data nerds, right? Yes. Uh, because being data driven, like you said, is a powerful thing. And and that's one thing that, you know, we would love to see more CDI programs out there doing is, is taking advantage of those local resources to analyze data uh, in a in a better way, right? We know a lot of people are out there doing fabulous work around data collection in some CBI programs. But um, as Anthony said, the last thing that we, uh, according to the last thing we spoke about, you know, we can always maximize our efforts, right? We could always build yes. up. And, and I think we have time for one final question for this panel. Um, Anthony, this is going to go to you. A major part of community engagement work for CBI practitioners um, is the ability of CVI programs to recruit, train, and retain credible messengers um, as part of their project. How can CVI programs maximize the work they do to recruit community residents as credible messengers? Um, and how do you keep them at the table after uh, recruiting? Yeah, good question. And uh, and again, uh, uh, Brenda's been having so many good points. I want to just highlight one that I just well, don't want us to miss when we yep. talk about data is that storytelling, because that's data itself. Uh, and how we do that and how we help support folks do that, I think is key. Uh, and one more thing that you talked about too, Brenda, is around who convenes and how they convene. It's very important if we're really talking about how to build out an ecosystem and how to keep everybody at the table. Uh, that convener has got to be trusted by all. Yes. It's got to be seen as a trusted partner and mm -hmm. a good collaborator and, and about the mission and not about themselves. So I just want to uh, thank you for that <laughs> because I think those two points were right on and I did not want to lose them. But I think this ideal of credible messengers, right, is that uh, there's so many people in community who, again, if knew that this was an opportunity, would want to be a part of it, right, who would want to figure out how to do it. So I think, again, as CVI organizations are out doing their work, they and as they're recruiting folks, they've got to make sure that one, they're giving them the right training, right? They're giving them the right support. Uh, uh, and again, you know, all of this, again, means we're building their capacity to do all of these things, right? So that folks can take the time to train folks, right? Get them the training that they need, give them the support that they need. Uh, and as, as the field continue to grow, right? We've got to, you know, we all know that uh, that, that there's been uh, there's been there's opportunity for us to better pay the folks who do this work. Uh, uh, there's better uh, there's opportunities to provide better uh, benefits to folks who do this work. Uh, there's opportunities for us as a as a country to recognize the folks who do this work for who they are: frontline workers, emergency workers, uh, folks who put their lives on the line so that they get the same recognition as our other folks who do uh, public service work or uh, public safety work. Uh, so I think, again, some of this is really around creating the capacity for organizations to do what I believe they want to, just don't have the resources to, right? So we are training folks on the fly. We're giving them the best support that we can because, one, we're at this sense of urgency that we've been at for a while. Uh, but I think, you know, LeVar, it's just really a, this ideal, again, uh, of creating space for folks to be trained. One of the things I've, I've seen in D.C., they got the Peace Academy that they just uh, mm -hmm. graduated their first cohort. I think the Chicago has got the Nonviolence Institute. There's places where have that have come up that are training uh, our, our CVI workers to give them the skills that they need, adding on to their already the, uh, the, 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 the uh, 
the, the their relationship with community, but giving them the other skill sets that they need to be uh, uh, part of the work. So I just think it really is around her. The, the compensation and, and the, the, the benefits and the, uh, and the elevation of the work that we have so many people in community who I think would find this as a perfect career. Uh, mm -hmm. One, just don't know it's there. Two, I don't know how to get into it. And three, uh, uh, don't see, uh, we have not also created what the pathways could look like when you get into CV. How do you move from a outreach worker to a interventionist to a case manager to a supervisor right so really just helping folks walk through but i think uh, uh because we've been at this for a long time and so many people care deeply about their community and the people who live in their community folks have found their way uh, but i do think it's opportunity for us to be more strategic and more uh intentional about creating space for folks to f be trained and recruited and retained in this work uh, mm -hmm. There's just some work for us to do on our end. But again, I keep advocating that we just need more resources for folks to uh, be able to put the right amount of, to pay folks for the right amount for what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, so, you know, I'll leave it with that, so yeah. Yep, such a good point. Um, and, and that's one thing, you know, uh, Fernando at UPI, shout out Fernando, um, always talks about like, what does that upward mobility look like, right? How can we make sure that we're uh, training people for additional positions, right? You can't be on the ground working as a violence interrupter forever, right? Um, if people want to come into this field and we want to expand this field, we have to create those ladders of opportunity for people to move into different positions, right? Um, so that was something he always says that stood out for me. So um, thank you guys so much. Um, thank you for sharing your time and your expertise. Um, really appreciate you guys joining us today. For everyone watching, uh, we certainly hope you enjoyed today's first panel discussion. Uh, we're going to pause for a quick short video break and then we'll circle back and pick up on our next panel, which will be discussing CBI partnership development. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Selma has changed the world twice and we're not done yet. Selma was a stronghold for the Confederacy during the Civil War. Selma was a catalyst for change during the voting and civil rights movement. There's still much work to be done, and I am convinced that we are up for the challenge. In 2014, our county was the poorest in the state, and in 2016, Selma was the most dangerous place per capita in the country. Broken relationships have led to broken economies and communities all in need of healing. Racism operates on a personal, cultural, and institutional level, and so must our solutions. Our model focuses on three sectors, law slash governance, education, and economy, addressing pain points on all three levels, adapting programs from across the world, and innovative programs created by us. Selma will be a model of the beloved community. The beloved community block clubs, the Good Trouble Citizenship School curriculum, and the Circle of Elders will help residents build power and self government Once the fourth wealthiest county in the nation because of enslavement, Selma will now help all to prosper. Our seamless educational approach will ensure that each child and adult can prosper using their gifts and talents. This includes adaptations of the Harlem Children's Zone, Freedom Schools, and STEAM support through Ed Farm for our teachers, youth, and adult learners. Join us in fulfilling the beloved community dream as we change the world once again. Selma, you are have a community that has been disinvested in for 50 years, the culture sets in where we get used to having disinvestment, we get used to having poverty, racism, etc. NFCCC has been about the business of trying to change that culture. When I heard that Rodney and others were putting together a quality of life plan, we said sure we'll, we'll get on board and help organize. We gathered about 25 to 30 organizations together in a room and started talking about our vision for the community. I got involved with the Quality of Life Plan because I saw how we've been totally disinvested in as a community and why complain when you don't want to do the work to make it better. April 16, 2016 was our first official conference. When we finished, we ended up with 13 areas that we wanted to rebuild. 
goals and eventually became our quality of life plan. What the quality of life plan does is it gives you the demographics and helps you understand how does data inform what you're going to move forward and do. We were all committing to making this a better community. So we all set and we planned and we just was good, I guess, good comrades. <laughs> And sometimes there are things that are aspirational that we want to do we don't have the ability to do today but you know that's why it's kind of a living breathing document and as we get some successes in certain areas we're coming back to the plan and say okay what have we done what do we need to do to improve it when i think about what's transpired in north Lawndale as a result of the creation of nlccc we have the north Lawndale employment network workforce development campus we have an ogden commons we're also seeing the beginning of the Thousand Homes project that our housing committee has started to formulate. We uh, ran a big action to get the library redone and a couple years later, two and a half million dollars has been invested in our library. So those kinds of developments are the things that do keep people inspired. The quality of life plan has changed my life and I'm excited about the things that's coming and the things that are happening now. All right, wonderful. Uh, so welcome back and thank you all for joining us for our second panel discussion around CVI partnership development. Um, before diving into uh, this next session, we'd like to remind you all uh, that at any time throughout uh, today's webinar, feel free to populate the chat with any questions that you may have. Um, we'll do our best to answer all questions. However, uh, we ha do have limited time uh, so we may have to answer some of these qu uh, questions at a later time. Uh, stay tuned at the end of the webinar um, where we'll have an email address uh, where you can send any additional questions you have. And we'll also be sending out to all individuals who registered for today's webinar uh, a post-webinar email, which will have answers uh, to additional questions uh, from today's webinar. Uh, lastly, we want to encourage you to join the conversation online. Again, as Eddie mentioned earlier, let's make some noise, right? Let's let them know that folks from the community, folks that are working and doing this work on the ground, care about this work and want to advocate for additional resources and attention to the great work that you folks are doing. So get on your social media channels, hashtag uh, CVI, Strengthening Communities, uh, definitely make your voices heard. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce us uh, to our second panel for today's webinar. Uh, so first up is Ayinka Jackson, who is the executive director of the Selma Center for Nonviolence, Truth and Reconciliation. Ayinka, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, our next panelist is James Timpson, managing director of Community Violence Institute uh, for the Roca Impact Institute. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, Managing Director of Community Violence Initiatives for the Roca Impact Institute. JC, JT, you would think I would know that uh, by now as much as we work together. JT, thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, and lastly, Rodney Brown, the Executive Director of the New Covenant Community Development Corporation. Uh, Rodney, thank you as well for joining us. Uh, so to get things started, uh, just to sort of piggyback on some of what we had already talked about. So of course, this session is all about, uh, you know, partnership development, how we can do a better job of, of uh, developing strategic and thoughtful partnerships. Uh, we know in order to, and Ayinka, this question is for you. Um, we know in order to maximize the impact of CVI work, you have to grow strong partnerships, right? Um, these partnerships, as we alluded to earlier in, in our last discussion, uh, should be designed to fill in the gaps, right? You should be you should be reaching out to partners that have something that you don't have, right? Uh, in many cases, uh, to expand your violence reduction ecosystem locally. So, could you tell us start tell us a little bit about yourself, a little about your background, but also how partnership development has been critical, a critical part of the violence reduction initiatives your organization works to advance locally uh, there in Selma. Well, first, thank you so much for having uh, me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll just say that I've been a teacher 
a case manager in the foster care system, a guardian net litem representing children who are abused and neglected, and a public defender. And I saw how all of those different institutions connected. And so if those institutions connected, then we have to connect as well, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to be in partnership as well. And so when I moved back home to Selma, uh, to really get at the root causes of that work, uh, of the, the harm that I saw being done um, with those multiple uh, systemic issues. Um, I knew that partnership had to be a major piece of that. And so, you know, since Selma was named the eighth most dangerous place per capita in the country, um, USA Today uh, in 2019 named us the uh, ninth poorest town in the country. And last year, our murders went up by 56% since that time, right? It's impossible to deal with that level uh, right. of problems, right, without partnership. You just simply uh, cannot do it alone. Um, our founders knew that dealing with these different types of violence, racial violence, um, physical violence, economic violence, that we had uh, to do it together, right? And so Dr. Lafayette, who was a leader in the Nashville sit-ins, the Freedom Rise to Selma movement, and who Dr. King appointed to be over the Poor People's Campaign, um, said at our very first board meeting that there was unfinished business of the civil rights movement, and we needed a Selma too. Uh, that there was unfinished business. And so our charge is Selma 2.0, uh, bridging divides and building the beloved community. And you can't build the beloved community without being the beloved community. And so being that beloved community um, with those partners is, is crucial. And so I'll, I'll just say one thing as a foundation, because often we don't know what people mean by beloved community. And it, it is a really grounding force for our partnerships. Um, and, and partnerships uh, is the first line of our mission, right? Having those partners. And so beloved community is an overall concept uh, to achieve a reconciled world by raising the level of relationships to a point uh, to a height where justice prevails and people can fulfill their full human potential. And so that definitely requires partnership. You can't do that alone. It prioritizes relationships, right? And so those relationships with our partners uh, are really prioritized, including the community. That's excellent. Uh, yeah, just want to hit on this piece. Simply cannot do it alone. Uh, that, that's such a, I mean, you said it right there. And, and that's what it is, right? And, and that's part of what this whole work is about growing out these ecosystems, because this work cannot be done in silos. And CVI partners and organizations cannot do this work alone. And that's the paradigm shift we're really trying to communicate to people uh, today. Um, JT, uh, coming to you next uh, with a, uh, a question. Uh, likewise, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, but also um, tell us why partnership development is central to the work that ROCA does, right? And, and how those partnerships uh, benefit and aid the clients that you guys work with every day. Uh, yeah, sure. Good afternoon. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Again, my name is James Thompson. I go by JT, Managing Director for CBI for uh, ROCA. Uh, lo I'm located in Baltimore. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I've been working, doing this work in Baltimore. CBI worked for a very long time, uh, as well as I've worked um, in the mayor's office and city hall. So I've kind of seen it on all different sides. Um, when I think about CBI and the importance of the partnerships that, that we create that best benefit our young people, sometimes it forces us to think outside the box and, and consider partners that traditionally don't fit into the landscape, right? We talk about criminal justice partners. How do we also educate our criminal justice partners of how to better serve our young people as well? Because it's not about accountability only falling one way. When we want partnerships at the table. We need everybody to be accountable on the same level to achieve the same goal, right? And that's safety and health and well-being and prosperity for our young people um, or for our communities. And so when we think about partnerships, we think about not only the education that we could receive from from partnering with other organizations to help us with our mission of serving young people, but what also is the education that we can provide about our young people to help other partners 
um, eliminate maybe some implicit bias, some some stigma, some other things that have been associated with our young people, right? To help them understand from the true lens that our young people come from. They're not their behaviors. Their behaviors are a, a, a result of their trauma, right? And we have to help partners understand where our young people truly sit in this fight, right? So we work very closely with those partners as well as our young people to kind of bridge that gap. Because if I know that my young person is coming in with coming in contact with law enforcement, probably much more than I would like them to, but it happens, right? They're seeing law enforcement every day in the neighborhood. They're seeing the same officers over and over again. If I can teach that officer how to deal more effectively with my young person, as well as teach my young person how to deal effectively with that officer, it keeps everybody safe, right? And it keeps the community safe and it makes the community healthier, healthier and stronger. Um, traditionally for me, that was a hard concept to, to grasp, honestly, mm -hmm. enter into CBI work. Um, because I've always been taught to run the other way when I see law enforcement, specifically when it comes to this work, um, because of the gaps that have been created over years. But then in really understanding the trauma and the position of my young people, what I really understood is that if we really want to change this landscape, we have to really think about how do we collaboratively bring everybody to the table as partners. Right? Because that's the only way we get it done is if we re-educate and change the narrative for everyone around what this actually looks like. What does true collaboration look like? What does creating this true ecosystem look like? Because whether we like it or not, some partners who we want to exclude will not be excluded. They're going to be in our communities anyway. So if we can teach them the ways to work with our young people to maximize the best results for those young people, then it's a win-win for everyone, right? And then it hopefully will address some systemic issues that have happened in the past, you know, that, that the community will, will no longer have to deal with. Um, it'll hopefully, hopefully address a lot of different things that are kind of almost unintended rewards of making sure that those collaborations happen. So, you know, it's, it's extremely important because my number one goal is to keep my young people safe and help them reach their potential, right? Other partners at the table may have different goals or different, uh, uh, yeah, different goals that they have to meet when it comes to that same particular young person. But how can we sit together and have a healthy conversation around how do we help this young person reach that full potential, not excluding accountability because accountability is important, right? But how do we reach that potential with that young person without the first thing being consequences, without the first thing being demonizing? without the first thing being stigmatizing, without the first thing being all these things that we are so used to doing with these young people, right? How do we truly form a collaboration that, that allows a healthy environment for not only our young people to prosper, but also for that community to prosper? So, I mean, when we think about partnerships, we really started thinking out the box to, to see how we can maximize the best results when working with all partners to help get the results, the desired results for our young people. Mm -hmm. And, and that's like, that's the paradigm shift, right? Right there. Uh, you know, you described it perfectly. It's like thinking outside the box, like you said, changing the narrative. Uh, we really have to start to think differently about how we're building out this work. Uh, because, I mean, you know, this is, we have to have a sense of, of, of urgency here, right? And we need an all hands on deck approach. So really like that. Um, uh, like that, those ideas that you shared. Um, Rodney, going over to you next, um, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, but also, you know, how your team at New Covenant approaches the work of developing new partnerships. You know, if I'm a CVI program or I'm a CVI organization and I'm listening to this today and I'm saying, you know what, based on some of the stuff I'm taking in, I could probably go out. I, I want to go out and expand my partnership. I want to reach out to new partners. Um, so for folks attempting to develop those new partnerships, um, what are some considerations uh, that I should have or take into account or have top of mind? Thank, thank you, Navarro. I appreciate that. And thank you for this opportunity to be here this afternoon. Well, so again, Rodney Brown, I'm also the executive director of New Covenant CDC, but I also serve as the on, on the executive committee for NLCCC, that's North Lyndale Community Coordinating Council. It's an organization in North Lyndale that's all about rebuilding the community. 
Uh, we were launched Mini New Covenant into North Lindell back in about almost, no, about maybe 10 years or so now. Prior to this work, I worked in corporate America. My last position, I was global director for procurement. One of the things that was vitally important for me was in, in that role was I learned about teamwork. I learned how to work together. I learned how to pull on others for their strengths and utilize those to help reach my goals as well as their goals. Taking that experience and coming back to North Lawndale, uh, one, one of the things we looked at in New Covenant was when we came to the community, we were launched here with a the, with the mandate to help rebuild this community. And I want to point out that North Lawndale is a community that has been disinvested in at this point for better than 50 years. So if, upon the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., there was the abandonment then at that point, businesses left the community, business leave, uh, residents leave, investment in this, from the city leaves. So we have in the community vacant lots, debilitated homes, people that are looking like, what's, what's, gonna, what's gonna happen? We came, we looked around, we said, what's the best thing we can do as a team to help rebuild this community? Our expertise was in business. So we set about determining how we would help fit in with the rebuilding of North Landale by helping to build an economic infrastructure in the community. We're a small organization. We realized up front we were not going to be able to do it by ourselves. So as we developed relationships in the community, we took stock of what our other community partners were good at. We've heard a lot here today already about partnerships and working with others. We made sure that as we developed relationships, we, make, we made it clear that we weren't going to do everything, but those that were serving the same people we were serving, we made referrals to them. We understood what was important to them. We helped them reach their goals. If you're looking to establish partnerships, one of the first things you wanna understand is, is there a common goal that you can work on? But then beyond that, I also need to understand what's your goal for your individual organization? What's your goal for you? Because as I help you achieve your goals and objectives, you can help me achieve my goals and objectives. And the one thing I can say about NOCCC and about North Lawndale, and Brendan, my, my lovely partner in North Lawndale, made a comment earlier about the people around the table that we've been working with. The one thing that I think has been tremendously significant for us in terms of making sure we understand what's going to make us successful is that we never took our eye off the ball in terms of what's best for the community. We were part of the people that were part of the Pritzker Travel Award, one of the finalists for that. And somebody asked me, you know, you got 30 people at the table. How do you make decisions? Well, you got a lot of egos, you got institutions, all those things. But at the end of the day, what we did when there was a decision to be made that was not necessarily something that was easy to build consensus around, we made the determination we were gonna follow what's best for the community. And that's how we made our decisions. That's what led us to being in a position where, as Brenda talked about earlier, we did a lot of storming, norming, and forming. There were some rough days, some rocky days, but when you boil it down to doing what's best for the community, that makes the decision easier, easier and that makes partnerships a lot stronger. Thank you. I think this question is uh, going over to you. Um, so once local stakeholders uh, or partners have been established um, in a CVI partnership um, and you have folks at the table, uh, what can they do to start the process of aligning priorities and identifying overlapping strategies to uh, prevent duplication of efforts, right? Uh, you know, it's great to have a, a large partnership uh, working with you, but at the same time, you know, there becomes a need to be more strategic about like who is at the table, right? Um, what does that look like for you? So, uh First, let me just, just say that I think it's important that we look at community residents as a community organization, as an entity itself. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we make sure we never leave them off of the table when we are inviting institutions to the table. Mm -hmm. um, two is that we remember that, you know, that we, we in our racial equity training, we think of um, that, that participate presence is diversity. Um, inclusion is participation, but equity is power at the table. So making sure that all of the partners have power at the table, including the, the community residents, is very, very 
crucial. Um, I think that it's so important for us to, to be intentional. So much harm is done, not because people don't mean well, but simply because oftentimes, because we're busy and we're overworked and ever, all these different things that we're not intentional. Um, so for example, we have a decision-making matrix. And as a part of that, we have guiding questions. But if we don't use it, right, it, it does us little of no good, right? So uh, a couple of, a few of the questions that we use in that that really speak to this is who within our market or ecosystem, right? Because we, we want to be an ecosystem, not an empire, right? Uh, as you spoke about a moment ago, is currently engaged in similar work. Uh, does this thing we're considering fill an important gap are we uniquely positioned or best engaged to do it? Um, or is someone else, right? Are we better to help facilitate this or enact it, right? For us to really wrestle with this even before, um, because there may be somebody else better in our community to do it. And if we've done that work before, it would definitely help when we bring it back to, to other partners. So that, that's, that's another piece. Um, also, I think that, um, partnership is hard, uh, as the, the first panel said, right? Uh, if there's an African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to go far, go together. But that takes a lot more to do. And so you, you have to have things, you have to be able to lean into conflict, right? Um, one of my favorite quotes is, conflict is the spirit the relationship asking itself to deepen. It is through conflict that relationships are strengthened and we begin to see each other in our authenticity. And so when conflict comes, which it inevitably does, right? Uh, conflict is inevitable. Combat is a choice that we really wrestle with our partners um, and lean in and, you know, in a very positive um, way and being value centered uh, is so important in that. And so if, if we know each know our strengths, and we lean on each other for our strengths, um, then we we don't overstep, right? Um, the, the last piece I'll, I'll say about that is um, one of my favorite quotes from a friend. She says, Selma is a gold mine, but we're too busy fighting over the dirt. Well, I believe that there's so much gold for us all to have that there is no need for us to fight, right? That we all can get what we need. There is enough to go around, right? And so if there's enough to go around, then with our partners, we all can get what we need in a given situation to make sure that our community uh, get, get what it needs as well. Mm -hmm. Love that. Uh, JT, sending this one over to you. Um, so a big part of partnership development work for CBI organizations is to ensure uh, you have the right partners at the table, right, who can assist you in providing impactful wraparound services uh, to the individuals most in need. Um, what advice can you provide to CBI organizations when it comes to identifying and engaging the right service providers uh, to be part of your CBI efforts? Um, yeah, that's really important. I would say, first of all, we have to, we have to make sure that we're clear about who it is we're serving and what service we're actually providing, right? Because I think, um, I heard Ayinka say it best just now when she just said it's, a, it's enough to go around, right? We just have to you know, understand like who's providing what, who's better at providing this as opposed to it being a competition about who's providing, right? Um, and once we figure that out, then it kind of gives us a better roadmap to kind of figure out who can best service the needs of our young people, particularly young people in a given situation. But the problem I find is that a lot of people just being honest, aren't really honest about who they serve. Mm -hmm. well, the work that they do, they they think that they serve a population that they don't, or they mm -hmm. say that they serve a population that they don't because they see a dollar attached to it. Oh, well, this grant is worth this much. This grant is worth that much. And so when you start getting into the weeds that way, oh, it's so harmful to young people, right? It's so harmful to the process. It's so harmful to progress because there's definitely somebody out there who probably can do it better than you if that's not what you specialize in, right? So we're very clear about making sure that we service who we say we're going to serve and stand hyper-focused on that. I won't run a housing program because I don't do housing. 
I don't care how much money they give me to run a housing program. I will reject it and get and try to go find an organization that does housing because I don't do housing, right? Even though I know it's a critical need for my young people, but guess what? If I shift my focus or start taking away what I'm doing with them already to try to focus it on something that I'm not good at doing, then I'm only hurting the, hurting the progress, right? So let me stick in the let me stick in the lane with which I know I'm best at serving, and let me uplift other partners around me who may not have the infrastructure or may not have everything needed to be able to service the population at the level that we may need service. But guess what? If we collaborate and work with them, maybe we can help them build up to reach that infrastructure that they need. Maybe we can help develop, you know, uh, uh, better resources or better partnerships by planning the people's strengths or organizational strengths of what organizations do best. And we can't blur those lines because when we try to bloom a million flowers, they all die, mm-hmm. right? But if we pay attention to making sure we raise that one right, you know what I mean? The chances of it surviving and living is much better. So I think that, You know, we're very clear about who we serve and very clear that if we don't have that service, it's not always about creating it. It's about going out and seeing if it exists first. If it doesn't exist, then let's go a step further and find out who might be best at doing that. Because it doesn't always have to be me or doesn't have to be our organization or us. Right. We may be somebody who we know that that's perfectly aligned for. They just haven't realized it yet. Well, let's help them realize that vision so that they can join this fight, right? So that they can be a part of this process and so that we can make sure that true collaboration is happening because that does a couple of different things. It strengthens services that already exist in the community, number one. Number two, if the service doesn't exist, it introduces a service, a new service into the community that's vitally needed that may not have been introduced any other way. Right. But through that need and through the willingness of somebody else to come in and help this program or help somebody who, you know, would do a good job at it, actually prosper at doing it. the benefit, the young people in the community. <laughs> That's what we're looking for. Right. So it's about taking the I, we, the I, we and us out the game. Right. And really figuring up, figuring it about or taking the I out, not the we and us, but taking the I out and figuring out what the we really looks like. You know, and really helping reach that potential for organizations that, you know, do good work. I know a lot of small organizations that do good work. They may mm-hmm. service five to 10 people. Right. And in my mind, I'm saying, dang, I would love to, for them to get up the capacity to be able to serve 50. And 50 may be their cap. But guess what? That's an additional 25 or 30 people that weren't getting serviced or additional families. So it's really about, you know, planning to uh, your own strengths and then helping build on the strength of others. Helping build on the other strength of others. Because a lot of people, I think somebody said it before. I think Anthony said it on the last call. I mean, on the last panel. Some people don't even know that these things exist or that these opportunities exist until you make them aware. Like, man, look, you would be good at this and this is how you could do it. Now the opportunity exists. The community has a new service. The community has a new champion. You know, the service is there for that young person and we can continue to do what we do. So I think it's really about strengthening the partnerships by looking at how we can help partners build if they aren't there or how we support them if they are there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And know who's there, right, by by doing the homework, by doing the work. You know, um, that's what asset mapping is all about, right? Uh, getting an idea of what those assets are that exist in your area so you know what to tap into, but then also knowing what's missing so you can work to recruit or and advocate for what you know you need in your specific neighborhood or community. So good points there. Um, Rodney, sending this one over to you, um, you know, many times when developing partnerships, you know, people don't take the time to think through shared goals uh, of their partnership team, right? Um, Things like how decisions are made, the level of communication partners should have uh, between one another. Um, Can you speak a little about the importance of establishing those types of organizational management components, right? Um, and, And by Taking these things into consideration, uh, CVI organizations can lay the groundwork for developing more impactful collaborations, right? But but explain to us the importance of taking that kind of stuff that some folks don't take into consideration, making that top of mind for folks. 
Uh, but you know, it's it's important that those kinds of steps are taken because again, you know, when oftentimes what happens is collaboratives are built on the fly. You know, there's an issue that comes up. There are people to get together to talk about how to fix it, and they just they get off and running. And it's it's like the, the way I look at it is there's a different foundation that's needed for a single story building than there is for a 10 story building. And so if you don't take the time to put in the proper communication, the proper foundation early on, that 10 story building is never going to stand. So for example, NOCCC, we, since our inception back in September, 2015, we have continued to meet every month. Uh, we, we may take a month off in the summer, whatever, we continue to meet every month, Committees report on what's going on, what they're doing. We make sure that we're communicating how we might be able to help and support each other. The focus being looking at what's going on that's contributing to our quality of life plan that's helping to execute the plans we wanna put in place for the community. When you're talking about making sure that you wanna have successful plans and successful partnerships, it's important that you understand that everybody's working towards the same goal of building a community, but at the same time, we all also have to make sure that we're addressing our own individual concerns as well. So communication becomes very important. The, the, the thing that uh, we also try to make sure that we bear in mind is also making sure that the community is also at the table for those discussions in one form or another, so that as you're looking at understanding what it takes to establish those long-term partnerships, establish those goals, the community needs to always be in mind in terms of what's going on, because once you lose the community, then it becomes a us versus them. And it doesn't matter how tight your organization may be. If you don't have the community in your, on your side, they're not working with you. They don't feel like they're supported or that this is important to them. Then your organizational objectives won't, make, won't make much difference as, as it relates to rebuilding the community. So when you talk about laying the groundwork for developing impactful collaborations, you have the organizations, you have the people, and then you have to make sure that you're working on what's best for both. Someone asked me a question recently as it relates to the work we're doing. And they said, when you talk about building community, are you talking about the people or are you talking about the things in the community? Mm -hmm. Very important distinction. At the end of the day, you have to make sure you're doing what's best for the people, but also understand that the people need those things. So the way that you're going to make sure that the organizational components are in place is you establish regular meeting patterns, establish communication, establish a way to make sure that the community is always engaged and making sure that you're doing things along the way to kind of check to make sure, are we on track? Are we not on track? Is there anybody that we left out of here that should be part of this communication? Because the thing that also happens sometimes, we get very used to having some of the, uh, usual suspects, if you will, at the table making decisions. We need to also make sure that we're reaching out to others and say, you know, let's make sure we're communicating to them as well, and that they understand what we're doing, and that we're also making sure that we're looking at what they're talking about. Again, I'll go back to what Brenda said earlier. When we put our plans together in the beginning, we asked ourselves, what do we want to see in North Lindale in the next five to 10 years? Even then, we were thinking about how we're going to work together as partners, how we're going to make sure that we have the components in place to always make sure that we're, we're considering everybody's perspective, everybody's strengths, and then how we can make sure we address any gaps along the way. Thank you for that. Yeah, and, and I mean, and that's, you know, uh, a more drier, you know, topic to discuss, <laughs> but it's so critically important, right? We know so many times people think, oh, I'm going to put this huge partnership together, uh, and, and you get there, you get the people at the table, and then have no idea what to do from there, right? Um, so taking some of this stuff in mind is, is critically important to being successful in the long run, right? Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that, Rodney. Um, Ayinka, over to you. Um, you know, we spoke earlier about uh, capacity building earlier, um, specifically as it relates to community residents, but it's also important to work to increase the capacity of local community-based organizations working with people engaged in community violence. Um, can you speak a little about um, identifying and prioritizing gaps in services where additional resources uh, can make a significant impact? And, and also why it's important to ensure these organizations have increased capacity. Um, so, yeah. So this capacity issue is a, a real issue, particularly in, in rural areas. And, 
it's a, it's, a, it's a myth really that that violence is an urban issue. Department of Justice studies show, right? It's, it's, it's not a black or white issue. It's not an urban rural issue. It's really where we see poverty, right? Uh, and so, um, and in our rural area, we see a lot of poverty, right? And so we have these urban issues, right? Uh, urban challenges with rural resources, which makes it really difficult, right? And, and, that's, and that's just not financial, the lack of financial resources, which is a, a, a struggle or um, means to uh, properly evaluate things. That's a challenge, right? But basic things for most people, right? For mental health services, uh, we won't even get get into uh, culturally competent. Let's just deal with having enough of them, right? Um, not enough. Alcohol and drug treatment places, not here. Even a, a, a shelter for the unhoused, like just basic things that most communities have. We don't have those things and, and not nearly enough if we have some of them. And so those challenges make it particularly differ, uh, difficult for a CVI program because, for example, our street outreach program, um, workers, they end up doing a lot more than what they are actually um, would normally do, right? Um, you know, uh, we recently had a case where all night long, uh, uh, one of them were talking to a client on the phone because there wasn't another entity for them to be referred to, right? And so that lack of uh, services um, uh, and, and uh, already with a small program, you know, is, is really difficult with such high rates of violence in the community. And so we have to lean heavily on the part as we do have um, as we seek additional funding, uh, as we seek to help them with additional funding, which is also important, right? Um, that when we find out about things that we send that their way as well and support them because all in all, this is really about our whole community and, and not about the Selma Center for Nonviolence, right? Um, this is about um, the people, as uh, Rodney uh, said, this is about the people having what they need. And so um, building that capacity uh, is, is so important. And it's also important while you have to have partnerships, not just locally, but uh, statewide partnerships uh, and national partnerships. That's why we are in partnership with Live Free uh, and the Nonviolence Institute in Rhode Island and in Chicago, because um, when you have those limited resources, it's so important to be connected with organizations like LIST, right? Um, so that uh, you can get connected with resources in terms of knowledge uh, and training, um, but also financial resources to make sure your community has what it needs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, this we are almost out of time. I think we have like two minutes left uh, until we get to our Q and A session. Uh, thank you guys so much for hanging in there. I know it's been a long webinar, but you guys are doing an incredible job. Uh, JT, last question over to you. Um, you know, when developing partnerships, we know many jurisdictions limit their outreach, right? And I think you hit on this a little bit earlier and have a very narrow focus. Um, how can CVI organizations work to develop relationships and partnerships with city, state, federal, uh, and even foundations or business partners? Hmm. Um, I think for us is, is, is recreating the narrative and helping people really understand and the importance of the work. Um, a lot of people have already have a lot of foundations, businesses, um, already have ideas of uh, what they think their work looks like or what their work actually involves and entails. But like specifically in a city like Baltimore, we know that there are a lot of businesses in downtown that worry about their employees coming back and forth to work too. Right. And how do we get them to be a part of the fight? Right. How do we get them involved? And it's really about educating them on the benefits of in investing in these programs beyond what your corporate structure looks like. Right. What, what are the benefits that, that really uh, will, will help your corporation be a part or your company really be a part in the change, the community change? Because the reality of it is, is that a lot of places will. Um, will sit down and build camp in, in somebody's neighborhood or somebody's backyard without pouring in the resources to support 
uh, the change that 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 it will bring. For instance, a company comes in, builds a big warehouse. You've got all this extra parking and this, that, and the third, but you're right next to a a, a poverty stricken neighborhood. Well, yeah, they're gonna break in your cars. <laughs> yeah, they're gonna steal and rob. You know, like those things are gonna happen, right? But how do you invest in the community to help alleviate that? Right? How do you invest and, and not and prior to you coming to the community? So let, let's invest on the front end instead of on the back end, right? Because it takes much more on the back end than it does on the front end to, to just go ahead and address the problem. I think a lot of times people turn blind eye to what's right there in front of them because it's easier to ignore it than it is to address it, right? But when you can go and say, hey, look, this is a problem that needs to be addressed. It probably affects you. This is how we're willing to do the heavy lift. This is the support we need. Right. I've been surprised at how much that approach has actually worked for us uh, and just having conversations with people who nobody has ever just taken the time to have that conversation with because they assumed they wouldn't listen or assumed that it would go to any. It wouldn't go anywhere. Right. But just being, you know, a, a, a true believer in, in collaboration for all. We got to have those difficult conversations. We got to start being comfortable with having difficult conversations in spaces where Difficult conversations are usually ignored. They usually, you know, run from because that's the only way that true change is going to happen. Is that we have to, you know, uh, give people the language, give people the understanding about what's going on with our city and what your investment means, what your collaboration means, what your partnership means, what your help means uh, for the city, for the people in these neighborhoods, for our young people, just just overall in general, for your employees, for your staff, for your your organization. Right? What does it actually look like? What's the actual benefit? And I mean, I think it's really about just really sitting down and taking the time to have those conversations when people are willing to listen. We're in 2022 and, you know, we've been through pandemics and all this other type of stuff. Look, if people are not ready to have difficult conversations now, then I don't know when they ever going to be ready. But I'm tired of waiting. So <laughs> I'm tired of waiting. So, you know what I mean? It's about, hey, let me knock on your door. Let's have this conversation and see what we can get with it. That's great. Thank you so much for that. And, and again, thank you all for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. Um, right now, um, we have a few minutes left uh, to get into some Q&A. Um, so I'd ask uh, all of our panelists to uh, uh, definitely turn your cameras back on. Um, and we will go through our list of questions. Just a reminder uh, to folks, if for some reason uh, we aren't able to get to your question uh, today, we will be sending a post-webinar uh, email out with uh, a list of questions and answers from today's webinar. Um, so uh, real quick, I'm going to go through a couple of these questions that we got. We got some interesting ones. One, and, and so I'll, I'll throw the question out. Anyone who wants to respond, uh, feel free to jump in. So a question from the field we got. Um, we are aware of the problems within our communities. We have good ideas that could contribute to reducing crime in our communities. But if the people in power are not willing to do their part, what can we do? And that's for anybody. So I'll, I'll jump in there. Um, one of the, the things that um, the, I thought about when seeing the, the title of this is that uh, Shirley Chisholm said, uh, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair, right? Uh, and so we we have to do, we have power, right? It, it's, I don't really believe in empowerment. I believe we have power. It can be mobilized. It can be resourced. It can be organized, but we have power. So to use our power um, um, and to come, even, the, even though we may not be invited, and that does not let them off the hook that they need to come to our communities because that is their responsibility as well. Let me say that. I also say that, um, I, I really encourage people to use the steps of nonviolence, even if you don't believe 
in nonviolence, right? In the strategy, it really is uh, as a strategy, a way for information gathering. And this information will be sent out to you as well. Information gathering, education, right? These steps to help you get them to do what you what your community is demanding them to do. So often we we skip to direct action without doing the information gathering and education. And sometimes if we did those first steps, we could skip to reconciliation, but oftentimes we move directly to direct action before we do that other work. And doing that other work is so essential to us moving to reconciliation. And so um, really, to me, using the steps of nonviolence for conflict reconciliation can be majorly helpful in bring, making sure that those in power uh, and, and, and governmental power, let me say, because we too have power, to do what it is their responsibility to do. Mm. LeVar, this is Anthony. Uh, mm -hmm. Only thing I would add, and I think that's right on point, what the sister just talked about is just really this inside outside game, making sure that we are to her point, we understand what's happening, how it's happening and who's responsible for what as we build out our work. But also there's a lot of folks who work inside of these systems as well, who are who are good friends to the move to the work, who we need to make sure that we have relationships with, right? So making sure that we have an inside outside game. Uh, but I think that accountability piece is important but then also realizing our own power and how we build that. Uh, and I also think Live Free was raised earlier. Uh, there's got to be some organizing done to help build that power with the faith-based community as well. Excellent, excellent. There was another question that came in. Um, what is the uh, connection between place and crime? Can structural features like inclusive playgrounds decrease community violence? And again, anyone feel free to jump in and take that. This is Anthony again, just real quick. I think place matters. And I think uh, I think all of that environmental uh, uh, environmental work as a part of, uh, but I think that's also part of the long-term strategy and a part of the, the work. As we think about CBI work and we're thinking about how community gets engaged, Community members will tell you all day long, right? We don't have street lights. Our parks don't stay up to date and kids can't go out and play. So I think having all of those conversations around how we make place better, but also how do we make sure that we have the right intervention strategies in place and not just go straight to the environmental piece of it. Uh, because I think, again, that takes a longer time for folks to really get to the outcomes that we're looking at. So I think it's a part of the comprehensive strategy and it has a role. Uh, but I would not lean on that as the first step or the only step that we think about in the work. Mm. Excellent, excellent. Um, and Eddie, this one is specifically for you if you're still on. Um, as you look at the field and you know, you're out traveling to different cities, what are a couple of things that you see CBI programs are doing right? And what are a couple of things that you think could be done better? So, LeVar, I think the first thing that I want to acknowledge is that, you know, Amy pointed this out in her remarks. We have currently $100 million, right? We have the potential of $5, $5 billion for the next 10 years if Congress passes this. Those efforts actually came because of the collective advocacy of many of those who are on this call right now, who are listening in, who, who are in this panel. And so what I see happening across the country, whether it's New Jersey, New York, Philadelphia, Houston, and so on, this collective voice. I also acknowledge that sometimes there's some people who are not at the table. And so one has to wonder why are they not here, right? So are we, are we all being inclusive of this process? You know, um, you know, I shared in my remarks about the approach that we are trying to take here with, with the Office of Justice program, um, who carries the message and so on. But the first thing I wanna acknowledge, there's a collective effort being pushed right now uh, at all levels. Uh, the second thing that I would say that I see working is this idea of how do we continue to focus on those who are driving the violence. And that's also a gap. Uh, I would say JT highlighted that in his remarks as well. Uh, in my opinion, I don't think we're really necessarily targeting the right people necessarily. And so that's an opportunity for us to reassess and reevaluate what does it really cost to support people who are at the highest risk of gun involvement and victimization? 
Um, should we be thinking about our formulas what, at the government level, philanthropy? I know there's philanthropy on this call right now too, um, local government. How should we be thinking about supporting organizations not to be thinking about serving a thousand people, but maybe a, a, a smaller portion of, fo of folks that actually have this acute risk of gun involvement, right? So that's another area that I would say we are hearing more and more uh, organizations really um, tackling that issue. So more than I could say, but those are a couple of things that I, I wanted to point out. And the last thing actually that I'll say is we're seeing more and more evidence, more and more best practices across the field that we, even at the federal department at DOJ have to continue to elevate. And so today is one example of elevating other leaders uh, in this space who are doing some remarkable work here. And the spirit of collaboration and the spirit of how we're using data, it is critical. If you expect government and in many cases philanthropy to support this kind of work, we have to demonstrate the impact that we're having. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, one last question, and then Eddie, we'll, we'll throw it over to you for closing remarks. Um, this is a good one. Does law enforcement have a role to play in CVI strategies? And what is your perception of partnering with police? And again, this is open to anyone. I can't believe no one wants to jump in on that. I mean, I, talk, I talked about <laughs> it, so I'll bite the bullet on this one because I talked about <laughs> earlier with what I was saying. They definitely have a role to play, but here's... Here, here. Boy, oh boy. Okay, here, here, here it is, right? They do have a role to play, right? But they have to be willing to come to the table as a partner without authority, as a true partner, a true collaborator, right? Because that's the only way that we will really be able to bring you in as a true part of the solution or collaboration. Because if we're honest, there's a lot of mistrust with, with police department, with police throughout the country, right? Um, so how do we help instill or reinstill the trust in law enforcement within our communities, right? While holding them accountable for policing our, our communities in a just way, without victimizing the same people who we're trying to serve, right? And without jeopardizing the relationships that we have with the people that we also serve. Here is the key. The key is that my interest is to save and to help young people. My interest is not to solve crimes for law enforcement. That's their job to do. My job is to help young people prosper and help them be safe, help communities be safe. How do I figure out how to do that in an integral way where it doesn't put me in jeopardy or put or put what they have to do in jeopardy, right? That's why I always say there is always a level of accountability that people need to be held to, always a level of accountability. We never want to dismiss that from the equation. What we want to do is make sure that they're being held accountable in the right way, right? They're being held accountable because everything doesn't always call to go straight to consequences because a lot of our young people, quite frankly, don't care about the consequences, which is why they don't follow the law to some degree, right? So how do we bring law enforcement to the table as a true partner, show them how to truly collaborate with community? And it's kind of tricky, right? But you have to have a willing, a willing police department or willing law enforcement agency that's really willing to come to the table and be true partners in this work. Mm -hmm. And Thank that's you. the catch right there. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, bro. Uh, Eddie, I'm going to throw it over to you. I know we're a little behind, but take it away. for sure, take a few sure, Absolutely. Thank you, LeVar. Again, I'll take a few seconds here. So in the spirit of collaboration, uh, I want to acknowledge that at the most highest level of government, both at the White House, every other week we're coming together uh, through uh, several federal agencies to talk about the specific topic of gun violence or a CVI, PI. And so just know that there's a lot of collaboration, a lot of movement in that space. But I also want to acknowledge and, and express my gratitude for the Office of Justice programs in which various uh, leaders across our programs come together uh, also on a biweekly level uh, to really tackle this work here. Um, some are in this call, you can't see them, but I want to acknowledge them and their efforts and those who contributed you know, to, to the work that we're doing today. I will be the first to tell you that we don't have all the answers. We rely on people like you, the people who are tuning in to help us solve for some of the things that we're grappling with right now and to elevate those best practices. Uh, so we wanna acknowledge that and thank you as well. At the end of the day, at the local level, 
we know there's a lot of a lot of answers there. We have to continue to mine that. How do we pull that information out? Uh, lastly, I want to thank all of our panelists. You know, our moderator, uh, the List Foundation, for supporting such an amazing uh, first webinar um, from our kickoff. And at the same time, I also wanted to give a plug um, that we are asking you to help us promote this work, help us promote it. You know, across state lines, uh, the importance of CVI and what it does for our communities in terms of creating community safety. So with that being said, I look forward to seeing you again in our next webinar. Stay tuned for the updates of our speakers. Uh, and again, most of you have already RZP. We look forward to see you then. Thank you again, appreciate you and have a good rest of your week.